Hello, my name is Michael Wallace. I'm the current editor-in-chief of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And we're here today to launch a new series called Masters of Endoscopy, where we really interview the, 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 the leaders in our field, uh, those people who changed our field, uh, those people who uh, we all learn many lessons from. Uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, our interviewer t interviewee today is Dr. Peter Cotton. Uh, he was one of my mentors. Uh, I started out uh, my medical career at Duke University where uh, Dr. Cotton was a professor and endoscopist. And uh, after I completed my, my medical training in Boston, he had moved to the Medical University of South Carolina. And when I was looking for places to learn EUS and DRCP and advanced biliary endoscopy, uh, and asked where are the best places to go. Everyone told me to go to Charleston uh, to join uh, Peter Cotton and his colleague uh, Rob Hawes. So it's really my pleasure today to, uh, to uh, talk to Dr. Cotton, Peter, um, and uh, hear some of his wisdom and lessons that he can share with all of us today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Actually, you turned out pretty well, I think, Mark. Well, I had, uh, <laughs> I had good teachers, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I wanted to start off, Peter, um, start off just with your early career. Um, uh, if you could reflect a little bit on your training and your mentors uh, that helped you in picking endoscopy as a career, tell us a little bit about that experience and, and any lessons you would have for, for others. Well, it's not difficult to talk about my training because I didn't have any. Uh, in fact, uh, the first procedure I ever saw was what I did myself because at that time I was working, I was actually a trainee in London at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, just as fiber optic endoscopy was getting started. And I did have a mentor, Brian Creamer, who was uh, an internist interested in gastroenterology, uh, who recognized quite quickly that I was not gonna make a basic scientist, which is what he hoped I was gonna be. And we looked around for something else to do. And we found this, uh, we heard about uh, the new fiber optic endoscopes. Before that, they were rigid metal tubes. And so he got hold of one and let me loose with it. And there really wasn't anybody there that I could, get, anybody in the country that I could learn from. So we just got started uh, and learned fairly quickly. I don't think with too much danger to anyone in particular, uh, but it became quite quickly obvious that this was useful. And so um, uh, patients kept coming, coming from all over the place. And I ended up running an endoscopy unit while still theoretically in training. Uh, none, of, none of the bosses had the slightest interest in this new technique. In fact, they were rather upset about it because they wanted the trainees to go into the basic science labs. They didn't want them all going off into the endoscopy lab. So that was in London and uh, I stayed there for 10 years. And during that time, I was able to be involved in the development of a lot of the diagnostic and therapeutic procedures which, which we now take, take for granted pretty much. You mentioned that although you uh, were early, uh, early on, basically on your own in the field of endoscopy, you must have still had some mentoring from uh, others, others in your life, whether it, uh, even if it wasn't directly in the field of endoscopy. How, how did those yeah. mentors guide you uh, to, uh, and help you achieve the success that you have today? Well, my primary mentor as a medical student and then as a trainee was, a, uh, was an internist I mentioned called Brian Kramer. And he basically helped me by getting out of my way. Uh, I, I, I was sort of driven to, to do some of these exciting new things and he, he allowed me to do it. He enabled me to, uh, to get some equipment. And then he came back from a World Congress in Copenhagen in 1970 where a Japanese person said he could get a catheter into the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, which was an extraordinary statement at that time, a time we had no scans of any sort and said, Peter, you need to learn that. And he raised money for me to go to Japan, spend a couple of weeks uh, in Niigata, Japan with Kozuo Goshi in 1971. Uh, and so that really got me, got me rolling. Um, I was influenced very much by my dad, who was a country doctor, but unfortunately died, died young. But uh, I learned a lot from him about uh, looking after patients and how to deal with patients. Those are my two main mentors. So obviously, um, mentoring isn't just teaching you the procedure that you eventually master. It's sort mm -hmm. of guiding, guiding you to achieve what your potential is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I found that often true myself, that uh, you, you went a direction that you, uh, maybe your mentors didn't originally think was the right direction for you, but it sounds mm -hmm. like they were still supportive of you going off in your own pathway. 
Yes, I think, I think that's true. Um, as you know, I, I, I left London um, and, 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 and went to Duke University, and I was very fortunate uh, to, to be working there with Ian Taylor, who is the chief of GI, who recruited me there. And he, he as well was, was very helpful in allowing me to develop the endoscopy system there, which was, wasn't in great shape when I got there. Um, and it was he who uh, invited me, persuaded me to move with him to Charleston when he became chair of medicine. So he was a very important person in, in my professional life, uh, uh, moving me to Charleston where we now live and, and enjoy. Tell us about that uh, sort of international shift. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. so common, um, at least in the last 10 or 20 years, although I know it was more common in your era. We had several uh, outstanding biliary endoscopists who came from the United Kingdom. How, how does that transition help? Uh, how is that transition difficult to learn in one country and then move and practice in another? Uh, big difference, uh, and, and part of the motivation for moving for me was that at, at that time, 33 years ago, uh, the National Health Service was grossly under-resourced. At the university hospital where I was on the staff, there was just me as a gastroenterologist I was, uh, and doing internal medicine in a 500-bed hospital. There was one other person who was supposed to be there, but he, he wasn't there much. So it was really tough, and, uh, and uh, after... 10 years of that uh, and, and battling to, to, to develop things, I was in fact at the end being told to do less procedures because I was consuming things that other people needed. Uh, so it wasn't too difficult to realize that I needed a change. So I actually took a six month leave of absence, which I called a sabbatical, but well, they didn't have a sabbatical system in England. So I took six months off and traveled. And during that travel, I was offered a job at Duke. And, uh, Sort of, I thought, hmm, well, maybe, yes, why not? Uh, I haven't regretted it for one minute. The system, obviously, totally different, but, um, and the best of American medicine is wonderful, as you know. Uh, the worst of it is embarrassing. And uh, we're going through this recent stuff uh, about healthcare, it's just extraordinary. But um, the, the, the big change for me at Duke was that I was asked what I wanted. Nobody had ever asked me that before. Uh, you know, what, what did I want to build things up, whereas I've been told to slow things down. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I was given an opportunity to, to do what I wanted to do with enough people around so that I didn't have to do the things I didn't want to do, uh, which, which was very nice. So. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. In your, uh, in your recent career, really over the last 10 or 15 years since I've worked with you, you've made rightfully uh, very important uh, points about doing things that you're well trained to do, that only those that uh, can do a high volume, high quality procedures. Although, as you just mentioned, when you started careers, your career, you did things that nobody had ever done before and you'd never done and had, didn't have much teaching. Mm -hmm. How do we seek that balance now as we learn new procedures that have not been done? Right. How do we achieve progress and also maintain the, uh, the safety and good care of our patients? Well, there are two issues there. One is the, the standard procedures um, that need to be done properly, and I, I, my life has been consumed by pancreatic or biliary disease and ERCP, as you know, and I'm still very concerned about the fact that there's a lot of poor quality ERCP being done uh, by people who are perhaps not particularly well trained and, and who, who probably don't have the volume to maintain what skills they have or to increase them. So I've been very vocal about the need to improve credentialing. And your journal is kindly about to publish a paper from me showing that credentialing practices in the United States need to be improved. Uh, ERCP is different from other endoscopic procedures and it is only done in hospitals, uh, which gives the, gives the credentialing committees the responsibility to make sure things are, are done reasonably well. And that really needs to be improved. But your point about the new procedures is a, is a tough one. Um, some of them are sort of a little bit of a step beyond what's currently done. Um, but if something completely new comes along, then I think it's a responsibility of not only the people who want to do it, but the people who are, are proposing the new procedures and those who are providing the equipment to put together training courses uh, and systems to make sure that they're done as reasonably well as possible. 
I want to turn now maybe in a little more reflective way, have you uh, reflect on your endoscopic journey? What, what are the highlights of your career? I know we could go on for, for hours and hours talking about your many accomplishments, but for you, what, what were the highlights? What do you feel is the, the contribution you are most proud of? And I should say ongoing, you're still very mm -hmm. active uh, in the field, so. Well, it's got to be uh, seeing people that I've trained get into positions of authority like yourself. Uh, no question, that that's the, the joy of academic life. Um, and I've been fortunate to have been associated with and to learn from and to teach some superb people from many different countries, uh, which has resulted in the fact that often they've invited me to, to their places. I've had the opportunity to lecture and demonstrate now in over 50 countries, and uh, I still enjoy those invitations. I just came back from running a workshop in South Africa. Uh, had a very good time there. So uh, travel, mentoring, and more recently I've got somewhat more serious about research. Uh, I did a lot of rather poor quality research early on, and in fact, um, while I was a Duke, uh, somebody whose name you'll know, but I won't mention, uh, a biostatistician, gave a lecture on bias in clinical research. And he illustrated that six types of bias by six of my papers that, that I'd written in the past, <laughs> which is a bit embarrassing. But as you know, recently I've been NIH funded to do randomized controlled trials. And going back to my mentor, Brian Creamer, actually he gave me, uh, put on my desk one day a thing that said, those with enthusiasm have no controls, those with controls have no enthusiasm. Uh, so uh, controlled trials, and as, as you very well know from your position, there are more and more of them being done and done really well. So I think we see the science of our profession expanding enormously. I, I, I have to uh, comment on, you know, having been uh, the biliary fellow in Charleston in an era where we had five or six uh, cases per day of type three sphincter of OD dysfunction, and we did a lot of manometry and a lot of sphincterotomies and took care of a lot of people who had post ERCP pancreatitis. Uh, that to me is one of your great contributions in these uh, recent years and uh, I, I'm very glad to see that you've done such a rigorous trial. Do you want to comment on what, what led you to tackle this, this, this issue that was being performed so widely and confront, confront it with a, a, a rigorous clinical trial? Well, it, it's because, as you said, uh, uh, 10 years ago my practice consisted mainly of those patients of basically healthy middle-aged women who'd had their gallbladder out for one reason or another, who now had terrible pain, who weren't crazy, um, and uh, who uh, were being referred in for ERCP sphincterotomy because that's what the experts like myself thought was helpful, and increasingly referred in because community doctors were realizing that this was a dangerous procedure to be doing. And I, I got increasingly unhappy uh, of this benefit risk ratio, we saw a lot of pancreatitis. So that's what drove me to get involved in it. I didn't really expect to show that the treatment was completely useless, which is what we showed, as you know, um, uh, and that the patients who got a sham procedure did just as well. And in the five year follow up, which you're just about to publish, the people who had the sham procedure actually did better than the people who had the actual sphincterotomy. And hopefully uh, that has been a good contribution because hopefully it will have reduced the number of ERCPs being done for that in indication and reduce the burden of pancreatitis that results. Well, I thank you for that, taking that on. We often think that dogma is dogma and, and not until we challenge dogma with rigorous trials mm -hmm. uh, do we, do we um, sometimes surprise ourselves that the truth is not what we think. Right, that's true. Mm. Um, I want to wrap up a little bit with um, just your advice for novice endoscopic, uh, uh, novice endoscopists, so people who are starting their career right now, maybe you're in mid-fellowship uh, or uh, beginning an advanced endoscopy fellowship. What do you advise them? Read my books. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, children's books or? Uh, oh, and the children's books, yeah. of course. Um, well, obviously, you, I, I certainly advise people to follow their passion uh, if they really enjoy uh, uh, the challenges and the, and, and the triumphs of therapeutic endoscopy to stick with it, but to get really well trained and make sure that when they offer these procedures that they're doing it to the very best of their ability. So the fourth year is certainly uh, a step forward. Uh, 
nowadays, of course, it's not just ERCP, it's and not just ERCP in the US, it's ESD and EMR, and it's tough to get it all into one extra year, frankly. Uh, that, that might even be increased in the future, I don't know. But follow your passion and do it really, really well. Good, well, thank you, Peter. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I want to thank you for your contributions. Uh, GI is, has gone from strength to strength, not only because of you, but I think largely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. Not only for that, but uh, for teaching me how to do a biliary endoscopy and teaching me how to be a, a critical physician and, and endoscopist. It's my pleasure. Okay.